Sure. Uh, so that um, you know, you can direct your questions at whoever you like or either one. Well, why don't I have you come over here? And then I'll just stand out off to the side. And we've got our first question on this nice tall hand here. We've got a microphone coming up right behind you there, Jeff. How does this affect brain plasticity? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, while we're doing Q&A, someone else can ask a question. I can quickly show you a slide. Um, so my other sort of hat is I do a lot of brain imaging research. Yeah, I know you, you have Vanya Afkarian coming tomorrow. He will really dive deep into this. But we essentially were able to show that changes in sort of treatment response um, and brain circuitry was associated with decreases in pain-related fear. Um, so my sort of interest is like, how do we make these sort of brain changes like meaningful um, in, in sort of clinically important? Um, and so tying sort of processes that we understand like, you know, fear and in, in, in brain function. So that's um, as far as I'll go with that, but anyway. All right, and then we have a couple of questions over here on the right. Uh, we've got two side by side and then one up, up here. Okay, thanks both. I thought it was a wonderful talk. Thanks very much. Um, I'm interested to know your thoughts on uh, the thing that we often see within practice is the word acceptance. Uh, and obviously patients sometimes will give a bit of pushback and say, does this mean I just give up? So uh, I was wondering on your thoughts as to how we might reconceptualize acceptance. I should? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't think that I've in 50 years used the word acceptance with yeah. any patient. Yeah. Well, I probably have, but it crashed and burned, so I just erased it from my memories. Got it. Um, sometimes we use pain willingness sort of as a term. I, I don't find it necessary to do that. No. What I find to be relevant is to address the behaviors uh, and sort of the reason why they're doing it. Um, I mean, if, the, if I send the child or actually the adult home with sort of an exercise to explore something that has to do with getting towards a more meaningful life and they come back and they have hopefully done something. I ask them what did you do and they tell me that they did something and then I say okay so uh, I'm not going to ask you if it like if it was painful I'm not going to ask you if you were scared I'm not going to ask you if you you blah, 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 because I know that, right. of course. But I'm going to ask you one thing that I don't know. Was it worth it? So focus on the solution, not the problem. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, acceptance is sort of, uh, it, it's, it's within the exposure. Yeah. So you can talk about where you want to go, and you can talk about where you end up if you do the things that are sort of intuitive. So yes, we want to do something that is counterintuitive, but we need to identify why, what, and how. And we can talk about that without m making it complicated with terms such as acceptance. Sure. Thank you. And right next to Mike, Charna. Uh, so, Laura, um, the, you said that you, do, you treat your patients with the PT and the psychologist, um, one, like one patient and the two providers. Do you guys ever do group settings? And um, if not, why? So uh, in the program that we've been running, we haven't done a group-based um, intervention, but uh, Sismita Kasha Karzuk at Cincinnati Children's has a program called Fit Teens um, for youth with fibromyalgia. And she does something, um, She it's not with uh, physios, it's with, um, like trainers, I'm blanking on the sort of technical name, um, but essentially they do like a group-based intervention. So I think um, sort of I think there's multiple ways to get to the problem. Um, so I think it, it is possible to do it in a group-based um, format. I think what is nice about the individual is that you are really harnessing and focusing on their particular values their particular activities and in building the exposures around that. So it's, it's like, you know, an individual PT session. Um, and, and all of those exposures are sort of done by the PT. And what I, what I didn't mention is that half of the time the parent is observing those sessions and half of the time the parent is meeting with the psychologist to get sort of coaching and, and um, around sort of how to sort of shift things at home as well as their own sort of 
distress and distress tolerance related to seeing their, their kid in pain and encouraging them to, to do more. We have a, a question right up here in front, LaSanthia. Uh, while the microphone's on the way, could you expand just a little bit on the importance of the parent education mm -hmm. piece of that program? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, what, you know, it's really interesting. When I first got into pain treatment, um, there was a lot of talk about what they would call like a parentectomy. So let's remove the parent from the situation, fix the kid, because it's, you know, it's clearly the parent's fault, um, and then we'll send them home and they'll be great. Well, the problem is it's not the parent's fault. It's just like all of this. It's, it's that so a parent's response to their child in pain and suffering is to to nurture them and to care for them. And so they're doing what they know. Um, they're doing that natural response, just like you know we're trained to respond to pain in a certain way. Um, so essentially, by removing the parent, we're, we're also isolating them from the important education of how to relate to their child in the context of pain and how to encourage them to sort of kind of expand their repertoire of responses. Um, so we really sort of have shifted a lot um, over time. Um, and so now there's, there's less of that emphasis on kind of removing the parent's influence, but rather sort of trying to join with the parent um, as much as possible um, throughout the treatment so that they are sort of completely um, engaged. And even in sort of my outpatient pain treatment, I often, when I'm introducing a new technique or strategy with the patient, I'll have the, the parent in the room as well because if they don't, if there's any sort of sense of like, I don't know what's going on when you're in that session, um, and you know, and the kid's not necessarily like volunteering a lot of information, um, we want the parent to sort of really feel like they know what's going on, that they understand the treatment rationale, the process, and can sort of support those changes at home. Thank you. Question right up front here, and sure. then a, another one in the second row. I'm going to come back to the concept of acceptance. So I, my question kind of got already asked, but um, with that, even the word, and I love that you say that I don't use acceptance because it's so badly responded to. Like so many of the other concepts that we talk about in the room here, and we sort of then have to find another way to talk to patients about that, like the pain is in your brain thing that we really don't want to broach that subject. I wondered with those patients that, or have you studied or have you explored how those patients feel about the fact that maybe they do get their life back but the pain is still there and the pain doesn't change and some of the, a lot of the things that we you know, comments that patients and people will say in their narratives is if this pain would just go away all of that other psychological stuff wouldn't be there I wouldn't have to think about it and while we know lots of different things feed into that how can we are we studying this how do we understand that experience yeah well um, I think it's a good question um, what, what we see is that it is possible for patients to do things that are vital to them, also in the presence of pain. I think that's an important message. Um, from a clinical perspective, I've numerous times uh, seen how like, people are expanding their behavior repertoire. They're doing more things in the presence of pain. So they are liberated in a way. But what happens is also that the relationship with pain changes. So um, sometimes people articulate that in certain ways. And one of the things that I've heard is like, I'm not afraid of the pain anymore. I'm not sure it's exactly the same as fear of pain. But they say, like, it, it doesn't scare me. Um, so I think that's quite interesting. And another thing that I find to be very, well, like, I, I've been working with a, a pediatric anesthesiologist forever. And uh, it was funny because he couldn't, he couldn't resist from asking like after a treatment that we thought was quite successful. So he was like curious. So what about the pain? I was like, oh, damn, don't, please, come on. We would spend like 10 weeks trying not to sort of get into that stuff. But she was like, it was a teenager, and she said, well, funny you ask. Of course it's there. It's the same, you, you stupid. Uh, that's not, you know, that's not the thing. Like, it's, I'm, I'm living, you know, the best life I could ever, you know, dream of. So, uh, yes, pain is there, but it doesn't stop me from doing what I want to do. So I think that sort of illustrates sort of the, what we try to accomplish. Uh, it's not about reducing pain or distress, really. But if that happens, 
well, I don't mind. But it could never be the, the treatment objective because you can't control it. It's not something that you choose. Uh, you can choose your behaviors. You cannot choose your experiences. And Joan here. On... This might be our last question. Hi. Um, so I've been working with adults with chronic pain for about 24 years, and I've obviously there's an increase um, over that period of time in the numbers that are suffering from that. And I have some ideas about the biopsychosocial factors that have contributed to the increase in chronic pain. And I was surprised, I didn't know 51% um, of pediatric chronic pain. And I just wondered if you were willing to share some of your ideas um, about what may the biopsychosocial factors may be for that population? Oh, yeah. Um, in the sort of transition from pediatric to adult chronic pain? Or if they're even, or are they different? Are they different, not in the transition, but the factors? In the sort of contributing factors between mm -hmm. the two? Probably not so different. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that uh, there's, you know, social, I mean, just like the biopsychosocial model sort of, it sort of um, indicates that there, you know, there are social determinants, there are sort of vulnerabilities, um, you know, um, that all sort of feed into it. I don't know that there's anything particularly unique about the child. Um, I know we're, we're probably doing a slightly better job of understanding sort of the interactional patterns between child and parent and how that sort of um, promotes um, function or um, promotes sort of the vicious cycle of disability and pain-related avoidance. Um, I don't know that there is a, as much of a, a rich literature regarding things like partners and um, family members in their role in that sort of social determinants of pain persistence and disability. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that sort of gets at what you're have there been any social changes over time that... Like societal? Yeah. Hmm. Well, there's like that thing, the opioid epidemic, um, that's sort of been an issue um, that certainly has sort of um, changed the narrative about how we think about pain rather than it being sort of lived experience that we all at some point experience pain. Um, but rather, pain is something that should be should not be tolerated. It should be eliminated. So I think there's been a cultural shift in that sort of fix-it mentality um, that I think probably plays a big role. Thanks.